right? Somebody had to go out and fight and must have bought into the propaganda after all, right? That's yeah. sort of what happens. Um, but that sort of leads over to the other question that kind of I was, I was thinking about. And obviously, this is something that, again, our works are very closely related in many regards here. And I think this is something really interesting because we're dealing a lot of with perceptions and where you mentioned that they're, they're taking parts of stories from, this, from these newspapers to fit their stories. So when we look at these newspaper articles, how much are they crafting a narrative that fits the Southern goals, their political agendas, and how much is it does not what actually is taking place in Europe during these revolutionary nationalist movements transpiring and is simply designed for this is what our goal in the US is and we will manipulate the record to fit that goal and that agenda. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I always say that the Confederates that I look at are masters of ideological manipulation. So. On the one hand, they're responding to real events. So I can't think of any examples where they outright make something up, but they're very much responding to those events through the lens of what they're trying to accomplish, through the lens of how it's going to advance their agenda. Again, this is instrumentalist nationalism, basically. And so they're going to pick the events in Europe that will help them advance their perspective. They're going to interpret them in a way that will help them advance their perspective. And this is actually um, one of the things that I do in my book is I lay out the development and the origins of each of these three international perspectives, the liberal secessionist, conservative secessionist, and unionist. And then I trace how they're forced to change and evolve in the war as basically current events are going to threaten all three of these all three of these perspectives in various ways. So when we look at the liberal international perspective, for example, they've been claiming that the South is legitimate because it, like Italy, represents self-determination and a fight against tyranny. And Giuseppe Garibaldi, a key leader of the Italian nationalist movement, was a key point of comparison here mm -hmm. for Confederates who are claiming we are like Garibaldi and that proves our legitimacy. And then, of course, at the start of the Civil War, the United States offers a command to Garibaldi. And Garibaldi is pretty much happy to accept if he didn't have to do, deal with issues back at home in Italy, and if he was given the right to be commander in chief and free the slaves, both of which were non-starters for various reasons. But the free the slaves in particular disproved Confederate comparisons. They were not like Garibaldi. Garibaldi himself made it clear that the defense of slavery me meant that the Confederacy did not represent what Garibaldi's Italy um, represented. So instead of kind of going, oh yeah, we made that up, it's not real, we're going to have to let go of this perspective, what these Confederates do with the liberal international perspective instead is they respond to this invitation to Garibaldi, but they respond by manipulating Garibaldi as a symbol of nationalism. So they start claiming that Garibaldi the hero of two worlds, an international celebrity in his own time as a hero of nationalism, they start saying he wasn't a na good nationalist. He had nothing to do with his success. Um, he was a terrible military leader. He was disloyal. He was unpatriotic. And so they're trying to claim then that, well, if Garibaldi isn't a nationalist, then the South can still be like Italy even if Garibaldi says otherwise. So they're responding to real events, but very much manipulating their interpretation of those events to advance their own agenda. 